Hello, Wyatt. Uh, as Jack alluded to uh, at the end of his talk, uh, the talk about exponential advances in technology quite often actually ignores the fact that it's just not enough uh, to invent the technology. You also have to get it adopted. And when it comes to embracing new technologies, uh, the healthcare system doesn't have like a perfect track record, let's put it that way. Um, barely an hour before I started preparing for this talk, I opened the window on my desktop and enter entered a few commands. As a result, a website called metamed.com uh, vanished from the internet. Metamed was a medical startup uh, that I co-founded in uh, 2012 and was working on since. Uh, my co-founder, Michael Vassar, had the idea for Metamed uh, after observing the slow and painful process that new technologies and uh, breakthrough medical science uh, has to go through in order to be adopted in the healthcare system. The average delay between scientific discovery and its adoption in the healthcare is 17 years. Not to mention that many valuable results don't get adopted at all or just end up being practiced in a few university hospitals. So Michael's idea was to assemble a team of doctors and scientists and offer the healthcare of future but today uh, by mapping out and evaluating the fragmented landscape of healthcare services and also cutting edge uh, knowledge from medical science. We described ourselves as um, scientific second opinion or sometimes the house MD only for real. So what went wrong? A prominent venture capitalist, Peter Thiel, uh, who was also an early investor in, in Metamed, once said, failure is typically so overdetermined that people never learn all the reasons for which they failed. And I agree with that. It's foolish to present a definite list of uh, uh, reasons why you failed. However, there was one reason that stood out in my opinion, a problem that also plagues the healthcare system uh, and causes many of the troubles that the Metamed was uh, intended to address in the first place. So that problem, to put it abstractly, is the wrong feedback loops in the system combined with insufficient awareness and attention to fixing them. So what do, we, what do I mean by feedback loops? A system engineer would explain it uh, that feedback loops are causal chains in the system where the output of the system is fed back to its input in order to regulate the behavior of the system, which is very abstract, of course. Uh, but for instance, like I think more down to earth way of putting it is that uh, it describes ways our systems can learn over time. So for instance, the workhorse of machine learning is the feedback loop where the errors in the output are fed back to improve systems accuracy over time. But more generally, uh, feedback loops dictate how a system or its parts are going to change over time. And it is, the change, is, is the change actually going to be an improvement or regression according to some metric that you're trying to, uh, that you're tracking? In Metamed's case, uh, the original vision prescribed such a feedback loop indeed. All the research we did, plus the longitudinal outcomes from our clients, should have accumulated over time and made us more competent to handle further cases. So Metamed's virtual circle was to help people, get better with experience, and then have even more people come to us as a result. At least that's what, I, what we imagined uh, our feedback loop to be. In practice, however, there was no actual mechanism in place in the company to feedback the uh, past research results and client outcomes in order to improve our future performance. Also, that one problem we had was that uh, uh, we just didn't have enough cases, so we start, had to learn a lot of fundamentals from the beginning with each new case instead of actually relying on, on the previous experience. Uh, but more importantly, our researchers were just always down in the trenches and under too much pressure with no cycles to spare towards the meta goal of improving the overall system. So hence the desired feedback loop never materialized. Uh, 
And when we were raising investment, uh, the first question we usually got from venture capitalists was, so what is your technology? And our answer was that MetaMed was not really a technology company, but a process company. And we would introduce technology over time as we learn where our actual bottlenecks are. At which point, almost all VCs said that they didn't see how this could scale and promptly lost interest. Eventually causing my co-founder to quip in frustration that these days, if you are in the jobs creation business, you are unfundable. <laughs> in hindsight, though, we st should still have had uh, or centered the MetaMed around a piece of technology, not just so much to please the VCs, but because you need technology to form a backbone of your process, an objective feedback loop, so to speak, that you can tweak over time. Uh, because humans are not very good or not, not reliable enough uh, to do this. Uh, now, that was about MetaMed. Let's zoom out from MetaMed and, and look at the healthcare system in general uh, and perhaps see some analogies there. I don't think it's a very pretty picture. Uh, healthcare is the only civil industry where new technology makes the prices go up, not down. To develop a new drug, on average, you need $5 billion and 12 years. Moreover, there is no shortage of embarrassing facts about the healthcare system. A book called Better Doctors, Better Patients, Better Decisions comprises a collection of studies about the healthcare system. It points out many, many curious facts, such as almost 10 million women in the US have had unnecessary pap smears. Unnecessary because these women have had their cervix removed. <laughs> Similarly, yet much more harmfully, millions of children are exposed to radiation in unnecessary CT scans. Not to mention that a plane full of people die every day in the US alone as a result of preventable medical errors. And would you fly planes if you knew that every day several of them would fall out of the sky? In his excellent book, Checklist Manifesto, Harvard surgeon Atul Gawanda explains how checklists have minimized human errors in aviation and construction and how they could do the same in healthcare. Could, because although Gawande's efforts have, have, have met with some traction, the checklists are far from being uh, kind of universally adopted in healthcare. So what is going on? Why isn't the healthcare system interested in self-improvement, at least not to the degree commercial aviation and construction are? Now this is where we get back to the idea of feedback loops. Mistakes in construction and aviation are very strong feedback. Pilot mistakes are on the news in minutes all over the world after they happen. So everyone involved is highly incentivized to adopt and improve measures to avoid those mistakes. Obviously, if a doctor ma makes mistakes, there is no comparable feedback. There is this uh, joke that doctors bury their mistakes. Uh, that's not to say that there aren't feedback loops in the healthcare system at all, of course. In an article called Slow Ideas, uh, Atul Gawande compares the adoption of anesthesia to that of antiseptics. Because of the immediate and visible feedback, anesthesia was adopted worldwide in less than a year, with, while antiseptic practices to, took decades uh, to, be, uh, to spread. I find that it's very helpful to think about the healthcare system not so much as a mechanism that was sort of designed uh, to optimize the health of people, but as an organism that has evolved over time, uh, if not millennia. A friend of mine, an economics professor at uh, George Mason University, Robin Hanson, has this uh, hilarious theory that the roots of healthcare system lie in the ancient times, where it demonstrating the loyalty by signaling that you care about the patient was much more important than actually healing her. That's why, he says, people still get all worked up debating the financing and distribution in healthcare, while being only lukewarm about the actual performance of the system. I'm not entirely sold uh, on that particular theory, but I have to admit that uh, the curious obsession that doctors have with wearing stethoscopes as talismans appears like an echo of ancient shamanism to me. More seriously though, many features of the healthcare systems can be tracked uh, back to actual historical events. 
For example, the US healthcare system is about twice as expensive as in the rest of the developed world, largely because of the side effects of a particular law uh, from, the night, from the end of 1940s. The law made medical insurance tax exempt for companies, thereby incentivizing them to inflate the health benefits as a fraction of salaries. So if the healthcare system is an evolved organism with accidental and weird feedback loops in place, what practical in, in implications can we draw from that? The first implication is that uh, when you hear about some new and cool medical technology, and you're gonna hear a lot here, uh, know that this is only half the story. Unless there is a relevant feedback loop in the system to pull it in, it might not get adopted. For instance, I recently talked to a radiologist who claimed that his profession would soon be obsolete because of the advances in AI and image processing, and Jack also mentioned that. I told that radiologist not to worry, because studies show that machines have been superior to doctors in diagnosis for half a century now, <laughs> yet are not widely used for that purpose. Again, in contrast with aviation, where autopilots are essentially ubiquitous by now. The second and more constructive implication of my feedback loops model is that uh, one might actually be able to introduce new feedback loops via information technology, just like we should have done in MetaMed. Now this sounds hard, but I actually have not one, but two startups in my portfolio that are trying to do something like that. The first one is doing marketing for general practitioners and hopefully introducing transparency and competition via its doctor directory and patient feedback system. The second startup is automating the laborious bits of ABA therapy for autism. And in the process, they are actually collecting evidence that uh, eventually should enable parents to make informed decisions about which clinic, program, and therapist to choose, uh, which in turn should improve the outcomes since the parents obviously are the most motivated part of the equation. Finally, the third implication of my model is that, if possible at all, entrepreneurs should try to bring their healthcare relate, health related technology directly to consumers. And there has been some talk about that as well, instead of relying on the healthcare system to adopt it. And there are, of course, significant legal, think about the 23 and Me that was mentioned uh, versus FDA deba debacle, and cultural obstacles to that. By cultural obstacles, I mean that uh, people don't often behave as consumers when it comes to their health, which is kind of curious. Uh, instead, they tend to delegate their decisions to doctors and expect someone else, that is insurance or the government, depending on where you live, to foot the bill. Now, there's another quote from my cynical co-founder. People are willing to spend their entire net worth, plus a couple of million dollars, if a doctor still tells them to. But if not sanctioned by a doctor, they would not spend more than 5,000. Unsurprisingly, in medical domains where people do behave as consumers, such as dentistry and optometry, the market forces have greatly improved the quality and outcomes over time. Now, in this context, I'm very hopeful that the quantified self-movement uh, and technologies like Apple Research Kit will introduce significant positive cultural shift. Now, for example, I'm quite sure that my basis watch here uh, would have been much crappier, more expensive, definitely, and perhaps even non-existent uh, if it had to have been prescribed by a doctor. So in conclusion, am I glad that I had the MetaMed experience, like those three years, uh, like even uh, investing a lot of my time and my own money into it? Well, I'm not, not actually sure. Losing still really sucks. <laughs> However, as they say, if you don't occasionally fail, you're not really trying hard enough. In fact, before uh, we started Skype, the technical founding team had been working, for, working together for, for a decade, uh, and many of our past projects uh, had been just complete failures. Now, as a silver lining, though, in this MetaMed experience, I definitely feel much more wiser now when it comes to evaluating medical startups. I know to look for whether they are trying to plug into the system, change the system, or go around it altogether. So finally, sometimes I joke that MetaMed was in the business of selling quality-adjusted life years. 
And I think the world still badly needs such service because that would, be, that would create an ultimate feedback loop in healthcare. So if someone would create it, I might be interested in investing and helping out. Not to mention that I have now a great internet domain name left over for it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Jan, you've also had some successful investments. One of them um, is a London-based AI company mm -hmm. called DeepMind um, that was bought by Google a year ago for a reported £400 million. Um, and I'm writing a big wide story about it, and I think I've talked to you about this. Um, what do you see as the opportunities in wellness care, in healthcare, of the smart, the general artificial intelligence machine? Uh, the thing with, like, when, when we are talking about general uh, AI, there is like, a, there is like an important uh, sort of phase transition that happens when you go from uh, domain-specific AI, AIs that are good at, develop, good at playing, com playing computer chess or indeed uh, sifting through the medical data to general AI, uh, because the general there means that it's able to do anything really. Uh, including develop technologies, including AI development. And I, IJ Good, a British statistician and, um, and that worked with Turing uh, during the World War II, uh, he made this uh, famous argument in 1965 that uh, general AI would really be humanity's last invention because like, it's from that point on everything will be invented by the machine. So uh, in that sense, I don't I don't, I don't think it's, I think it's a bit of a contradiction in terms when, when, when uh, some, like, when asking the question, like, uh, how exactly would general AI apply to a certain domain? Uh, because that's the general, general means that it's not domain specific. It, it basically can do everything. So as long as it's, it's within the bounds of the laws of physics. So I guess it depends on whether you're an optimist or a pessimist about <laughs> how useful evolving smart machines will be to um, human health. You've put a lot of time and also some funding into um, institutes that study existential risks facing yep. humanity. Um, but if you talk to the founders of some of these companies, DeepMind as one example, they say, well, this will help us solve scientific problems that you know, involve massive amounts of data that humans can't yes. cope with. So where do you stand on the optimist-pessimist line? I try not to. Um kind of uh, put myself on that line <laughs> deliberately. Uh, I, but if pressed, I would say that I am an optimist, uh, but I'm an optimist for instrumental reasons. Being a pessimist doesn't just, it, it's not going to help. Uh, so, uh, and I, I generally see my role as kind of uh, bridging the technology and scientific communities with that, those, uh, those people who are actually trying to figure out uh, how to uh, do powerful technologies, including AI, safely. Because if you think about it, uh, what the companies, technologists and scientists are really motivated to do is to increase the capabilities of their technologies and not necessarily thinking about thinking so much about uh, side effects. The famous example of this, uh, uh, like the gain of function uh, research in, in bird flu, uh, like a couple of years ago, years ago we had uh, this controversy about uh, is the good idea to make make the bird flu more infectious? And and uh, yeah, from uh, from the scientist perspective, is of course you get the publication. <laughs> but is the, could there be some side effects, perhaps? Well, thanks for thinking big, Jan Tallinn. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>